Um, I'm going to start this session uh, introducing Dr. Jagan John, uh, the lead of NHS Barking and Dagenham uh, Clinical Commissioning Group. Uh, Dr. John is um, a, a national health and well-being champion and is leading the work uh, for the Department of Health on the year of care. So over to you, Dr. John. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I can just say those spellings are not due to me. That's down to the health conference, I think. Right. Let me introduce myself. As mentioned, I'm a clinical director. Uh, I can see some friendly faces in the audience, so please don't heckle. Um, um, this has been a project in uh, NHS Barking Dagenham and out in North East London for, I would say, almost 18 months, 20, almost two years. So before all the sweeping changes, this project was happening uh, within our area, and it was really down to a particular need. So let me give you the context. This is our future. We've got a 252% rise in the over 65 year olds by 2050. We've got 188% rise in just diabetes by 2050, and I haven't included all the other long-term conditions. And of course, there's a, there, over the next couple of years, there is going to be a 60% increase in the number of patients with multiple long-term conditions. And the question I would say to you as systems, as people working in the front line, do you think we're ready? Do you think we can do more? That's the question. And then someone will ask you, well, what about the cost? Now, I'm not a big fan about discussing cost, but this is a real thing. 2016, you can see our cost of going to go up to around 26 billion for three or more long-term conditions. And this is the thoughts from across the international community in the Western world and in the developing world. The healthcare system that we have, we're not prepared. There's a huge amount of need that is going to come about. And that's a combination. It's just not down to long-term conditions. It's patient expectations, changes in health and well-being. And we need to understand what we're going to do about it. So these were our problems in North East London. We've got a, a mixed population. Uh, we've got deprivation, age, uh, different ethnicities and health inequalities. We had inadequate patient satisfaction. London as a whole has higher um, uh, dissatisfaction than the rest of the, uh, the, world, uh, the, rest of the country. So 27% of our patients in London are unhappy with the way the NHS is set up versus a much lower across the rest of England. And of course, in Barking and Dagenham particularly, we had some of the worst outcomes in terms of COPD in the country. We've got rising unplanned hospital admissions, probably very similar to a lot of the areas that we talk about, 10% in particularly. And we've got indications of variation in quality. And you've, of course, the mid-staffs report is a clear indication of some of that. Then on top of that, to add to the mix, we've had the restructuring. We've got CCGs, PCTs leaving, community and acute provider mergers, and social care restructures. And on top of that, there's an organizational issue, boundaries, contractual gaps, evidence of duplication, rationalization. And there is a question that all of our members, whether it be social care, health care, or even in the voluntary sector, is can we cope with any more? And then on top of that, there's different data systems. How do we incorporate all of these things together? And of course, the, the big uh, bull in the room is information governance, and I'm hopefully not going to discuss that today. So there is a question when we first started is, do we actually know what we're dealing with? And as Confucius says, real knowledge is to understand one's ignorance. And that was a journey for us. We used a thing called the NHS Institute of Innovations called experience-based design. We videoed uh, a quite a large number of patients and we asked them what was their feedback of the whole system. And actually we learned some valuable lessons, you know, something about what really patients are understanding. And I'm a big, big advocate for patient experience. If nine out of 10 people are saying something's bad, it's bad. And 
you do get the essence of feedback to all staff. So when you do some change, you actually say, look, I'm not going to say a thing. This is what our patients are saying. This is what our carers are saying about the system. And it does improve and it distills the message that we're trying to do. And it really gives us a reality check of why we're here, why are we doing these things. So these are probably common to a lot of areas. The system, too many admissions, readmissions, too much activity in secondary care, we're more reactive, not proactive, and we've got no real clear integration with services. And from a patient perspective, on a, on a most more importantly, there's anxiety, there's low levels of confidence in the system and in managing their own health. We've got proof of health Ill illiteracy, and the system is confusing to navigate. In London, as you know, we have lots of different hospitals, we have lots of different services, we've got walk-in centres, GPs, community teams, and how do you honestly believe that our patients will navigate when even GPs get confused where to navigate from? And of course there is a, a system right, um, reliance in terms of need or perceived need. So our vision some years ago was something a little bit basic. It was we wanted to coordinate care, we wanted better patient experience and better clinical outcomes. Our commissioners at the time said, well, do it for a lower cost and get more out of your teams. And we went for a whole system approach. It's about, it's actually almost 1.2 million patients. And at that time, we were looking for help. Where could we, um, where could we instigate change and how would we do it? So we went to the QIP LTC team to have a look at some of the research and some of the things that, that they were doing at the time. And there were three drivers that were key to their, their work stream. Risk profiling, coordinated care at a locality, and most importantly is the self-management. Now there's lots of conflicting evidence from different colleagues from here and in the US to say actually self-management doesn't work, but actually I could also give you just as much evidence to say self-management does work. If you empower patients, you're going to improve health outcomes much more than we'd ever achieve before. And, and in the Americans and a lot of the Western world and in some of the developing nations, they actually say self-management is the key to changing the health system. Now, people ask us, well, why did you risk stratify? Well, well from the videos that we did, we actually had evidence to say that people weren't getting the care that they were getting at the crucial times. And we had even more evidence to say that, no surprises, the data systems, although they've identified individually in their different teams the people at most need and, and had allocated some resource, actually we'd seen clear evidence of duplication. And then we realized on discussion with our colleagues that actually it was an assumption that we were aware collectively at the at-risk patients. And of course, the approach to the, the, the patients is very much built on the systems that you have. And obviously, I told you about the evidence and that, you know, you've got Chris Ham and even the minister talking about the international evidence to say, if you intervene at an earlier stage or you prevent you will lead to better outcomes and probably cost reductions. There is a bigger issue that we had to create. It's all good and well trying to create a system now to develop because this is what the national direction. But we've also got to remember this system needs to be there in the future, probably taking care of us or our loved ones or our relatives or whatever it may be. And so you do need to consider where we need to go in the direction. I do think, as frontline staff, we have that legacy to deal with. Just something about our data system. Our health analytics is the system that we use that integrates all this data. And actually, to an extent, the reason why I'm putting this, it designed a lot of our services as a result things like risk profiling, breastfeeding, cervical smears. It wasn't just about identifying the, the top 1% or the top 5% of at-risk patients. And what it did do is it gave us a platform to integrate social care, mental health data, as well as the, the GP systems as, as a whole. 
And even the GP systems, there are multiple GP systems in Barking and Dagenham particularly, and in Redbridge and Havering. And as a result of that, we were able to look at what, how we would go according to our teams, how we would design our teams. And I, I've got to give comment to our social care teams. Our social care teams were fantastic. They, they actually challenged health to say, we're prepared to change all our structures because we believe in this structure. And they did it for free because they believed that this is something that they would gain from in terms of their teams. So it's all good and well having all this information there to say, oh, these are the people at risk, these are the people who are going to hospital, these are the people who are getting a bad deal. If we don't use that information correctly, then it kind of defeats the object. So then we had to, based on the, on the long-term condition strategy, we de designed a methodology of risk stratification, care plans, collaborative team working, and provision of patients, and using our services, as well as having patient feedback and monitoring um, what we're doing. So this is our core team, the coordinated team. Now, the only thing I would say, this is we went for a co-located model, which means that the, the teams are in practices or in buildings which are owned by practices, um, simply because there is a lot of benefit of having teams literally in the same room working together. It, it just makes more sense. Now, you'd say, oh, wow, that's different. But actually, if you speak to some of the older GPs, they said, actually, we had this system years ago. You're, there's nothing new about this. My health visitor, my matron, my social worker used to be at the practice and have a chat with me about doing things. And actually, isn't it ironic that we're going back to a system that actually, you know, at least from, from my GP colleagues, felt that it was beneficial? And originally, our mental health teams were virtual. And the reason why they were virtual, because at the time, we didn't really probably understand mental health. Now we've realized, actually, mental health needs to be part of the core team, because we picked up so many mental health issues. And pertinent to what the minister said, mental health is a real issue in our communities as a whole, in terms of admissions and so on. And this just gives you an idea of having almost like a need-based approach for our patients. So for example, I had a patient who had a Parkinson's issues. It was my coordinator who coordinates all the teams to get the hospital to phone in during our MDT, which is, which is in a two-weekly basis at a practice, to discuss a particular issue. And, it, and that's where the acute care come to support it as well. And end of life is now recently joined, drug and alcohol. And it becomes, if there's a need, you bring that professional, you bring that team to that meeting. And behind this coordinated care team, you do need to look at a whole system approach where you're looking at the, the top, top part of that triangle is the, the high risk, the case management, our community, CTT stands for Community Treatment Team, who provide emergency care up to seven days. And then you have this integrated care pathways below that. And of course, further down the triangle, you have the self-management aspect. And one of the things that we're exploring is the use of pharmacy and our colleagues in the voluntary sector to, to try and do some of the self-management. And what we realized is that some of our colleagues in the community, they have a wealth of experience in dealing with their patients and dealing because they're convenient locations, they have relationships with patients. And it, I do think this is all about integration. It's really about personalization, making patients having a single access point. Through us, it's a coordinator, but also having multiple access points for help. And further to that was looking at a strategy in terms of, we, of how we're going to, what, what indicators do we have um, in terms of improvements. And this is some of the strategies that we've been looking at, are looking at a whole system approach using our hospitals. And basically, Amy, the patient that we've used in this particular uh, module, you can see that in May 2012, she'll probably have 15 and a half weeks for a fall um, going into the rehab going in and out of hospital. And we hope by March 2014, we've got 
actually people going in much earlier to prevent that fall. Giving that lady, that patient, independence at home, having the ability to get care within a timely fashion when she needs it, and trying to get this all done within her home with the right teams. And that sounds great, but it takes a lot of um, complete change in terms of contractual, getting different teams involved and creating some teams that doesn't exist. But this is where we'd like to go. I mean, and the most important point is really getting patients to see that this is actually beneficial to them and the carers as well. So what I would like to say, well, if you do integrate and you do build a system that you feel that is, is going forward, this is our version. It isn't perfect. There are problems. Every day I get a problem saying there's this issue, that issue as well. And you do have to solve the problems as you go along. But when you do get to a system, you do improve the, the, the anxiety for patients. They do trust the system. And they have improved confidence in the system. And having a single point, giving that ability to patients is very important. Actually, through our patient videos, that was the, probably the most important point they were um, harping on about. I want to get to someone quickly um, for my needs. And then, as a result, you do improve patient admissions, you do improve your workload. And interestingly, our workforce has improved in, in our area, which was a, a surprising benefit. Because it's a, it's, there's, a, and I, there's only one thing that I can say. If you have a team approach, if you feel supported, you're going to get people more likely to work in that environment. At least that's some of our social care colleagues, um, as well as our healthcare in terms of district nurses and matrons. But it still hasn't been solved. And it is about having a, a, a mutual respect for each other as well. But most importantly, as general practitioners say, you're dealing with the whole patient. You're not dealing with aspects of that patient, not just the diabetes, not just the uh, uh, mental health disorder. You're trying to deal with all of it. But further to this, we've realized that actually there is an issue with the way that we fund our system. So we're part of the year of care pilot for funding where we're trying to develop a sustainable way of supporting our social care and community teams by funding them to, to look at this project. And we're part of that research uh, phase. So we're dealing with patients with long-term conditions on need rather than just the disease. And the whole idea of by improving this funding, which comes from a lot of it in secondary care as well as from other sources, it's about best using that resource and improving outcomes. And what we're trying to promote is funding to a patient-centered care because with the problem with PBR and all the other things that we do have, sometimes that creates, and we've seen it, some of the boundary issues that we have. And of course, it does, it will have huge implications on commissioning, on contracting, and so on. But if it's what patients want, that they want to be in control, we should be doing our best to, to look towards that. And just gives you an idea of the scope it, you know, it's involving a lot of these blocks joining together as well, with primary care very much part of that model as well. And it is, I must say, it's a big debate about it, but it only includes the free social care, not the private social care. We've got, I've got mixed issues about that particularly, but at least initially we've got to discuss that. So we ha do have some outcomes. We have some improvements. We've got around 2,000 or 2,200 now who have MDT care plans, which now are going to be a virtual care plan. So all our teams can access those care plans from wherever you are. So whether it be hospitals, mental health, and they update those care plans according to their intervention. There's around 200 GP practices, four local authorities, two acute trusts and a community provider. There have seen coordinated care improvements in our MDT working and we have seen reductions in duplication. Very important for the patient and I am a strong advocate of that is having a nominated coordinator, a single access point. And interestingly, some of these patients actually develop relationships with the uh, coordinators and on first name terms and, and it, you, you these are the extra benefits you see. And the other things from our social care colleagues is that we have seen improvements to 
accessibility to the social care packages because of this networking and working together. But it, there is issues, and we still have working through it. We haven't, if we, if we had, had it all solved, we'll all have knighthoods, but uh, nowhere near that. We've seen some improvements. These are some of the reductions in the length of stay and so on. We've seen increased timeliness of care package. Um, we've seen a, a quite a significant reduction in safeguarding referrals, which is quite pertinent in terms of the mid-staffs um, issues a, as such. Uh, reclaiming social, there's a shared risk-taking. There's improvements in the pathways within the different teams. Obviously, locality working. Something that has been um, quite successful for our social care is having personal assistance. And they've seen a, a large number of um, payments for having personal assistance for patients. Because so they nominate someone that they choose and pay them. And we have improved our hospital in reach as well and reductions in, the, in residential care. It has improved our whole development of transformation of the, but I think it probably isn't enough. If we want a future, we probably need to look at how social care, how nursing, and how even GPs do particularly their, their roles. It, it may be that we need to start skilling them in other social cares doing some health aspects or district nurses doing some social care. You know, how far do you go? We've talked about the IT um, aspect and the intelligence that we had. We talked about the staff retention. And of course, this is a huge transformational piece. Now, our, one of our local hospitals is pretty much close to going bust and is, is heavily on the uh, uh, you know, problem pay monitor and the Care Quality Commission have been in. So they see it as a, as a win because suddenly it's sometimes getting their patients out into the community their consultants able to access these teams is a win-win for them as well. So the only thing I would say is in our journey, you have to believe in the same vision. It's very important. And there is something about upskilling and understanding this is all about quality. You have to understand what patients experience. And you continually, we're, we're looking at um, computerized ways of getting patient experience pretty much wherever they are in the system using apps or using um, other IT solutions. I would say ask the teams to be proactive. This, this approach was actually a collaborative team approach. They came up with the ideas. They suggested the solutions. They understood the issues. And interestingly, when we looked at the videos and asked them to comment, most of the issues was down to one thing and one thing only. That team doesn't communicate with me. That person doesn't communicate. A patient saying, I don't know what's going on. A carer saying, well, if my, my own, the person I'm looking after doesn't know what's going on, what chance do I have? And actually, the biggest issue that we found was communication. How funny in the 20th century that we're looking, to, you know, we, that communication is still the number one issue for our different teams. You have to respect each other and try to be ambitious, you know, we will be continue looking. We know our system isn't perfect. We will come to your areas and say, what have you done differently? What can we learn from you? Because there are wins that we all have together. And you do have to respect each other's leadership. I had no clue what social care did. I'll be honest. I had no clue what the voluntary sector could do for us as well. And actually, understanding that is a real win. And even our GP colleagues, from the feedback that we've got, actually understand something about how these different teams work. Yeah. And do allow for localized change, that's what I would say. Allow people to innovate as they say, see fit. In my particular area, there's a huge drug and alcohol issue. Well, allow that to be part of your team. Think about how you want to innovate that. And lastly, I would say is, we're all worried about the future. We're all worried about what will happen in the next couple of months, if not years. And I think the challenge is on all of us. And I would say, as Peter Druck would say, the best way to predict the future is to create it yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. I, I thought that was really um, enjoyable, well presented, uh, uh, succinct, but clear as to the uh, uh, as to one route of solutions, very helpful. We have about five minutes just to take a couple of questions 
if I can see people, in the, it's very dark here. Uh, is there anybody who's got a, a question they'd like to ask, Dr. John? I can see a hand right at the very back there, and I can see a hand here and a lady at the front. That's probably about it, I suspect. So there's a microphone coming to the gentleman in the back with the blue shirt, I hope. Oh, somebody, you've given it to somebody completely different. Might as well not chair it. Very impressive. It's very, very keen on integrating uh, uh, care. But in the example that you quoted, I wanted to see how you've um, done an impact assessment of the Lisbon initiative. Uh, the example that you quoted suggested that the length of stay for the lady who had the fall was certainly reduced in May 2018, and certainly in May even further in 2018. But a very important fact was the presence absence of the daughter in May 2012 that uh, uh, led to uh, the patient uh, being transferred to the hospital much later, uh, 12 hour wait while she was alive. So how does your, how have you done an impact assessment of the different initiatives? Because I think that the, the absence or the presence of the daughter and timely uh, care for the lady at the fall was a Okay, let, we've got the question, the impact. Do you want to just quickly take so that? So actually, it's a very good question because even I say we have to prove that whatever we're doing works. So something that we've, with our contractual colleagues through our commissioning support organisation, we've asked them to measure this and all the different teams have to measure what they're doing, how they're doing, what the carer is saying, or the daughter in this case, because this was just an example. Um, um, and then using that data platform, which we get three monthly, six monthly reports, we reflect on how well this is doing, because it may change, as you quite rightly said. This is a vision of where we'd like to be and what we can see the winds are, but it, we, you're right, there has to be a system of monitoring, and as a result, that impact assessment is actually woven into our contracts um, for this year. Okay, and I, I think that's a real, I mean, it is a real challenge in our system, is that we're making transformation, are we measuring getting the right outcomes? Exactly. So set that's a challenge and you're trying to face it. That, well, we've only got time for one more question. There's the guy in the blue shirt at the back. Can't hear you. Links with emergency services is all I could hear from that. Yeah, yeah. so um, you're you. right. So part of our core team in terms of the kind of coalition includes the London Ambulance Service. So looking at protocols, and we're also doing a project on what we call the high intensity users and looking at different models. As you know, the 111 has got mixed reviews, I would say that very bluntly. Um, and it's trying to incorporate that with our out of hours provider who happens to be the 111 service provider and the London Ambulance Service. And, and the interesting thing is when you have, um, I've been doing leading the highest users um, across, the, across the area. Um, I, I've just reviewed four patients that has cost the system one million pounds by themselves. Um, and it is really about getting the London Ambulance team, the hospital, and these integrated care teams, as well as the community treatment team, to really own up and work together to deliver the patient care. So I think it's a very valid discussion because every time that patient gets, uh, one of the particular patient, you know, falls down or in the road, they only go one way. Um, and I think it's a very important discussion. And in terms of quality of life, some of the, the patients that I've been reviewing across the whole sector, they're having 300 admissions a year. Now, being in hospital every other day cannot be a good quality of life in terms for that patient. So I do think it's a collaborative discussion and very importantly, having that with the patient to say, this is what we agree to have. How do you feel about it? That kind of action. But I think it's a very valid point. London Ambulance Team, the emergency care teams, 
are going to be some of the biggest wins that we're going to have in terms of the way we deliver. But it has to be a collaborative agreement as well and making sure it's uh, not, you're not putting the patient at risk in any way. Okay, folks, I am going to have to um, end the session there. D Dr. John has very kindly left his um, email address at the top there. I'm sure if people do want to kind of follow up um, points and, and discussions with him, I, I found that very interesting, very stimulating. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. John. Thank you. Thank you. Our, um, uh, I'm sorry these sessions all run in kind of half-hour slots. I, I know that was interesting. We might have wanted more.